All right, 1 Corinthians 11 is where we're going to be. So we had been working our way through this, and we got through uh, some, some really tough stuff at the beginning of chapter 11. Uh, the divine order of the sexes in the home, uh, God being the head of Christ, Christ being the head of the man, the man being the head of the woman. And once this order is laid out and practiced and kept, that is when God can truly bless a home. And that is when we will see the blessings of God on a home. Uh, and other than that, you're not going to see it. You, you're going against God's plan. And uh, that submission uh, of the wife to the husband, that submission of the husband to Christ, is absolutely vital in everything. Now, I do want to say one thing. When we look at this, and we see there in verse 7, uh, it says, For a man indeed ought not uh, so to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Uh, this, is, this is not necessarily saying that the man is better than the woman. But what this is saying is that when it comes to, an, I'll, I'll say, a discussion, and the husband has one idea of how we ought to handle a situation, and the wife has another idea on how we ought to handle a situation, and they're diametrically opposed to each other. Guess who gets the final vote that tips the tie? We'll see you after for some counseling. No, it is the man. Uh, that is what God has placed on him. Now, the only way this works is if there is grace applied. Okay? Uh, let's just say the situation turns out good. The husband doesn't go to the wife and say, see, I told you we should have done it my way. See how well this worked? Because that's going to put a root of bitterness in her heart. In the same token, the wife doesn't go to the man if it turned out wrong and say, see, I told you we should have done it my way and hold that over his head. Okay? The husband should say, you know what, hon? You were right in this one and I was wrong. We'll learn from it. Okay? Uh, but there has to be that submission to each other there has to be that love for each other. Uh, and other than that, this, this is not going to work. Marriages don't work unless you follow this pattern. Okay? Uh, they may work on the outside surface, but there isn't that nigh between you. Okay? Uh, that word nigh is a, is a precious King James Bible word that means nothing between. Absolutely nothing between. I know what that means. I, I know what it feels like, and it's precious. It's very precious. Uh, and uh, so, before I get all sappy and we, we digress there, uh, we're going we're gonna to come on down. Uh, we're going to get right into verse 17. Uh, truly, I would love to get in chapter 12 tonight, but I really don't see that happening. But we're going to see what, it, what the Lord brings us. Uh, but before we get into it, uh, Brother Joel, would you want to open our time of preaching and prayer? Amen. All right, now let's look at verse 17. Uh, well, actually, you know what? No, we, we ran through all of that. I had a mark in my Bible, and I, I was wrong in that. I'm sorry, folks. <laughs> Imagine that. So let's, uh, we, we had gone through the Lord's table and what was going on there uh, at the Lord's table. Brother Terry, could you dial this pulpit mic back just a hair? I'm getting just a little bit of feedback. Thank you. Uh, and so as we, we look at this, we got on down through to verse uh, 26. That was where we ended. We started into 27, but we kind of ran out of time. And so I'd, I'd really like to back up to 26. Uh, we're running through this and talking about uh, how the Lord had instituted this. This was a time of remembrance, a time to remember uh, the Lord's body broken, uh, the cup that is that New Testament in his blood. Uh, that was one thing that we pointed out, and specifically uh, that the blood is not the New Testament, but it is the cup that is the New Testament 
in his blood. Okay, And so uh, we, we examine that cup and what that relates to in different things. Uh, it says, for as often, in verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, all right, so wherefore, we understand when you see that, there is, there is information that was given before that is going to give clarity on this next statement. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, there are two ways you will be unworthy to take the Lord's table. One is if you are unsaved. You are guilty of his blood that blood is still on your hands, okay? Uh, just like uh, the nation of Israel, as Peter was preaching to them, he says, I want that you did this out of ignorance, okay? What he was doing was he was taking that Levitical law and that sin of ignorance, and he was putting the nation of Israel under it. And there was something very specific that was required for that sin of ignorance, all right? This is found in, let's see, Leviticus chapter 5, I believe it is. And once you, once you look through that sin of ignorance, what it was, was they were required as a nation to come together and the elders were to come and bring a bullock and ceremonially lay their hand on the head of that bullock and slay it, okay? Signifying their acknowledgement as a nation that they had sinned a sin of ignorance, all right? And then they were to sprinkle the blood on the people and, and here, there, and everywhere and do the different things with it. That's what Peter was putting them under as he, as he told them, you took that Holy One of Israel and with wicked hands you slew him. He says, I want that you did this out of ignorance. He was telling them, there is a responsibility. Elders of Israel come together. And what you see is that first beginning part of Acts, you see them contending with those Jewish leaders, going to the Pharisees, going to the high priest, going to these ones and contending with them up until Stephen. Once Stephen is martyred, then you see Saul come on the scene, and then it is opening up to the Jews. Okay, you see the progression of the book of Acts in this. God basically says, listen, if you as a nation will acknowledge your guilt before me, I will forgive you as a nation. Okay? They did not, and so the way was opened up for the Jews. You don't really see the the people going to the leaders much after that. Paul will go into the synagogues, he'll contend with them, but he is dealing more so with the common people. Okay, uh, So there, there's just one of those things that you see. And so being uh, unsaved, you are guilty just as the nation of Israel was guilty. Okay, And you're required to make an account for that. And if you take of this, as saying, this blood is covering me and this body was broken for me, uh, you are bringing damnation, it says, and we'll read this here, damnation upon yourself. Okay? Now that is not saying you are eternally damned to hell, but what it is saying is that there is a strong condemnation that is being laid against you and against your account. And this is, this is a grievous thing to the heart of God. Okay? Um, so they say, that, so that is, that is one way you're unworthy. The other way is when God has specifically pointed something out to you that you must repent of and you are unwilling to do so. When you know there's something between you and Almighty God and you come to this table and you take of this, you're taking of it unworthily and you are bringing damnation upon yourself. Let's read what he says about that. Uh, it says, verse 28, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. To discern is to see clearly. Okay? When you do not see clearly that the Lord's body was broken for you, and his blood was shed for you, and you come to this table haphazardly, you are eating and drinking damnation upon yourself. Okay? There is a great damnation that is held over you. All right? Again, this is not you losing your salvation. This is not you being put in a place where you are in danger of losing your salvation. If you think that you can lose your salvation or even give it back, you do not understand the nature of salvation. You don't understand what it truly means to be born again. You don't have any idea what it means to have your heart circumcised without hands, okay? That is something that cannot be reversed. 
You cannot be kicked back out of the family of God. You cannot be unborn again. That is impossible. Okay, so this damnation clearly is not saying you are going to lose your salvation. But I'm telling you what, it is very strong terminology. We, we shy away from using the word damnation in common speech today because of the connotation with it. All right, this is heavy stuff. And if you don't consider this as you approach this table and you come to it lightly, it is not going to end well for you. The Lord will have his will done. Let's keep going on and see this. It says in verse 30, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you. This is a physical reaction that God is placing on somebody who is approaching the Lord's table unworthily. And do you honestly think he's going to stop that from 2,000 years ago till today? No. No. It very well may be that some of the sicknesses that are racking your body right now are because you continually come to this table unworthily. Not only that, but it says uh, there's some sickly, weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. This is speaking of death. Okay? This is speaking of God continually to bringing to your mind that you are not right with him, and you continue to come to the table as though everything is just great, and he has warned you, and he has warned you, and he has warned you, and that point comes where it is a sin unto death in the Christian, and God takes them out of this world prematurely. Okay? Um, <coughs> excuse me. We see this uh, take place at least one, one time with Ananias and Sapphira. They were, they were lying against the Holy Ghost in that. Okay, and this is where we see those keys that were handed to Peter acted out. Okay, uh, whosoever sins you remit, uh, they're remitted. Uh, whosoever sins you keep, they're, they're kept, and, and all of this. Uh, this is a special authority that was given to the apostles, specifically to Peter, and he did act on that in Ananias and Sapphira. He proclaimed, you've done this wickedly, you've sinned against God, you're going to die. His wife comes in, says the same exact lie, and the, he, he tells her, the people that carried your husband out are coming for you. Dead. Now, you think, okay, well, they're believers. So, they've just been ushered into glory a little sooner. But think about every blessing they missed out on being able to serve the Lord. Think about the rewards that they missed out on. Think about the shame of standing before God Almighty, before the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his glory, and he is not able to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. He'll stay, still say, enter into your rest, but he cannot say, well done. Okay? This is the impact of this table down here. And what takes place when we take the Lord's Supper? Okay. This is serious. It is not to be taken lightly. Now, let's continue on. It says, uh, verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. All right? If we would examine our own lives, if we would be discerning in our own lives, judgment will not have to fall upon us. Look at your own life. That's why it says, let a man examine himself. Look at your life. This is a checkup. This is a time of, of remembering what God has saved us out of, remembering the goodness of God that he has placed on us, and examining ourselves to see if there is anything awry in our life that does not line up with the word of God. Okay? And it says if we would be judging of ourselves, we won't be judged. You really, truly have no need to fear coming to the Lord's table. If you are examining yourself, it is a blessed time. It is a holy time. It is a sanctified time. It truly is, as a group of believers coming together, one of the most blessed things that we can do, aside from sitting under the preaching of the Word of God together. Okay? Taking the Lord's table is an amazing event. So remembering what our Lord Jesus Christ has done for us 
And we're remembering what he saved us out of. Uh, Miss Heidi sang for us tonight, uh, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But can I tell you, he will not save you until you see yourself as a wretch. Verse 32, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. And that chastening is there in verse 30, that we should not be condemned with the world, okay? So we are chastened of the Lord, we are judged of the Lord, but we are not condemned. Because Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, okay? This is, this is a, a blessed truth that if we would grab hold of, it would really revolutionize our walk with the Lord. There is no more condemnation that can be carried against you. It doesn't matter how bad you have been. It doesn't matter what you did. You can't be condemned for that anymore. That is gone. Our iniquities are separated from us. As far as the east is from the west, God says he will remember them no more. All that lawlessness, you, didn't, you don't care if it was a law against man. You don't care if it was a law against God. You don't care if it was a law in your home. You don't care if it was a law of your parents. You don't care if it was a law of, of the town you live in. It didn't matter. No man was going to tell you what to do. I've heard that out of people sitting in this room tonight. That's a very dangerous thing to say. Because that's iniquity. And if it's not dealt with by the blood of Jesus Christ, it will send you to hell. But praise God, his iniquities are not imputed on our account. Our iniquities are not imputed. We read that there in uh, Psalm, let's see, 32, 2, I believe it was. Blessed is the man uh, whom, whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, okay? uh, in, whom there is, uh, in whom spirit there is no guile. As we consider that in our own lives, it is a blessing. It is a blessed thing to be out from underneath that condemnation. So this says here, uh, when we're judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. That chastening of the Lord is never pleasant at the time. Uh, there are usually lasting effects after that chastening takes place. And that sometimes hurts, and that racks our minds, and that racks our body, and that hurts. But the whole purpose is that we should not be condemned with the world. He chastens us to keep us from deep sin. That's what he does. Okay? He may allow you to go so far to the point where you see how far you are going, and then he'll bring chastening upon you heavily. Okay? When he does that, it's the goodness of the Lord. As I said last week, I believe it was, uh, somebody who's truly born again cannot be mad at God. Impossible. Because the Bible says you have the mind of Christ. Jesus Christ cannot be mad at his Father. and You have his mind. You cannot be mad at God. Because if you truly understand the God that you're speaking of, you would not dare be mad at him. Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Okay? Be very careful when you get to that state where you think you are angry at God. Whatever he has allowed in your life is for your good and his glory. And it is always good. So, let's continue on here. Uh, verse 33. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that, he come, that ye come not together uh, unto condemnation. And the rest I will set in order when I come. I'll speak to that in just a second. Uh, basically, again, remembering what he is wrapping up here, they were coming together and they were eating and drinking and somebody was being a glutton and a drunkard and the other person, their family wasn't getting anything. And it was, again, causing divisions in the church. So many things can cause divisions in a church. And 1 Corinthians is great for... Uh, a deep spiritual study of unity. What is required for unity? And the basic idea of it is to keep your eyes on Christ. When you keep your eyes on Christ, you see your fellow church member as a brother in Christ, 
and just as redeemed as you are, just as saved as you are, and you were just as much a wretch as he was, and you deserve condemnation just as much as they do. And when you get to that point, you have no argument. I yield my need to cast the blame or stone. I stand before Almighty God alone. Everybody, anybody ever heard that song before? I, I absolutely love that song. Uh, I stand before Almighty God alone. I yield my need to cast the blame or stone. I've given up, my heart is now exposed. I stand before Almighty God alone. And when you see yourself standing before Almighty God, it doesn't matter what anybody else has done to you because you cannot hide from that gaze. You can't hide from the light and the glory of God. So, uh, again, he's trying to bring them together in unity, warning them of the things that they are meddling in and what they are allowing into their church and into their lives. Uh, and so he, he sets all that. And then at the end of verse 34, he says, And the rest will I set in order when I come. Okay? There's some things that he needs to speak to them about face to face. And we don't know what those were. Okay. You remember they had written a list of things to him and now concerning this and now concerning that and, and now concerning this part and now concerning this thing. And he says, and the rest I'm going to set in order when I come. Okay. Dealing with, with the Lord's Supper, dealing with the authority in the home, dealing with, with all of that. There's some more things that he needs to address personally. Okay. Sometimes a letter will suffice. Sometimes a text is good enough. Now be careful with that, though, because you can't tell by somebody's handwriting their inflections and their tones. Same thing with a text. Okay? My texts may sound snarky to you just because my thumbs don't know how to smile. Okay? And uh, that's the danger in that. Sometimes it's best to pick up the phone. Sometimes it's even better to come to them so they can see your eyes. Okay? Your eyes tell you an awful lot. All right? So, now, chapter 12. What I've been looking forward to this entire time. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Listen, the, the Corinthian church was a very spiritual church, but they were carnally minded. They were using their spiritual gifts according to a carnal mindset. They say, wow, we, you can really do that? Absolutely. You mean somebody can preach and have a carnal mind? Yep. They can, they can be used of God and, and be carnally minded? Yep, you're looking at one. Okay. Uh, I, I preached the word of God. I taught it. And I did all of that as an unsaved man for many years. From this pulpit, from the pulpit next door, from the building over there. Taught Sunday school classes and everything. Thought I was born again. Hold into that profession until God showed me there was still blackness in my heart that I needed to deal with. Again, going back to this morning, I was addressing the sins, the fruit of my nature. I was addressing the things that I had done. But God had to show me who I was. He had to show me the blackness of my own heart. He had to show me the depths of my degradation. And that I was a wretch. Okay? And when he did that, and he showed me the Lord Jesus Christ as sufficient, born again, just like that. My grace is sufficient. That was the verse that he gave me that night. And that was, that was all I needed. But he, he took me to the point of almost breaking in order for me to see that. And I finally did break. I finally bent to his will. And I was born again. Thank God he didn't give up on me. Uh, he's long-suffering towards us. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All right? Uh, there it is. But we can be carnal and still exercise our spiritual gifts. Many in, in here have taken spiritual gifts tests, okay? What you are uh, most spiritually gifted on, what comes more naturally to you and all of that. Mine has always been prophesying or preaching and as the highest, and my lowest is mercy, Okay? Now, I will tell you, though, just because your lowest is way down here does not mean it needs to stay there. Okay? That just means there's things that God is working on in your life. 
okay? Do not use it as an excuse. Oh, I, I don't have mercy, so I, I'm just not going to show mercy. No, I don't have mercy. God, show me mercy so I know how to have mercy. That's the way it ought to be, all right? Um, but you don't need a spiritual gifts test. You really don't uh, if you have the Holy Ghost of God because he'll tell you. He'll let you know. Uh, one thing that you see in the book of Acts is that, oh, I really want to walk. One, one thing you see in the book of Acts is that uh, leadership naturally rises to the top. All right? it, it always does. When you take, um, let's just say there's, there's flour and maybe um, some oatmeal and maybe some rice and some other things in there in a bowl and you shake it and you sift it, there are some things that will settle down to the bottom and there are other things that will settle to the top. And, and that's just the way it kind of works. And when God is sifting a person or allowing Satan to sift them, as he did with Peter, uh, it, it tends to bring the natural qualities that God is building in a person to the top. Uh, you'll see that in leadership as, as it was Barnabas and Saul. And then as soon as it says Saul, who was also known as Paul, it then became Paul and his company. And Barnabas gladly took the back seat. Okay? Barnabas had been the leader. He had been the one uh, fighting for Saul. He had been the one fighting for him and, and promoting him and encouraging him. It's, it's good to be a Barnabas. And it's also good to recognize when your Saul becomes Paul and you see them rising up in leadership role. You say, okay, God, I see what you're doing here. And you allow that to happen. All right? that, that's being spiritually minded towards people. I'm really not sure where that came from out of just this one here. Um, but we, we just need to be spiritually minded about things, especially when it comes to these spiritual gifts. All right? Let's come on into verse 2. It says, Ye know that you were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Now, there's two verses I want to look at here. The first one is in Psalm 115, verse 5. And the second one is going to be a little trickier to find. Psalm 115 and verse 5. Actually, let's look at uh, verse 4. It says, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes they have, but they see not. Now, in your, in your King James Bible, when you see that word dumb, we understand that that means you can't speak. Your tongue is dumb. Okay? It doesn't mean that you're uh, mentally retarded or that you have a, a uh, learning deficiency or, or a hindrance of, sort, of such. Uh, it means that you can't speak. All right, so it says here in 1 Corinthians, ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols. These idols that could not speak. They had no hands. They had no eyes. They have no ears, but they, they have ears, but they cannot hear. Noses, but they cannot smell. Uh, they have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not, neither speak. They, uh, though speak they through their throat. Sorry. Uh, they that make them are like unto them, so is every one that trusteth in them. Dumb. <laughs> All right. We trust in the idols that we make for ourselves. You may not carve something. Maybe you have. I don't know. Uh, I know some people that have idols out in front of their homes. And what it is, is it's a little figurine. It's usually white and it's a young lady. And the, there's a bathtub that's buried half into the ground around it. Uh, and they'll go out and they'll worship that thing as though it has power. That is idol worship. Okay. Uh, it doesn't take much to discern what we're talking of here. Okay? But you yourself in your own home can have your own idols. Gentlemen, our tools. They can't speak to us. Oh, but we hope that they will help us. Our jobs. Our job can't speak to us. It can't intercede for us. Oh, we might have a union that takes our money 99% of the year and then blows it all on a, on a clam bake and alcohol and everything else. And uh, they might help you out a little bit come contract time. Right? That, that'll ring true for some here tonight. Um, that job's not going to help you. You don't understand that that job is not what pays you. That job is not what feeds your family. That job is not what gives you security. Job security is a lie out of hell. That phrase, job security. Do you know where your security is? 
That's it. The Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only reason you have anything. And everything that you have is on loan from him. Be careful what you're worshiping. Because you're carried away by these dumb idols. All of us have been. If you don't admit to that, you're blind just as your idol is. Search your heart. But it says, even as you were led, this is the second verse I want to go to, uh, turn to Zechariah. Now, to find Zechariah, you want to go to Matthew, turn back one book into Malachi, and then turn back one more book into Zechariah. Okay? We're going to go to Zechariah chapter 11. This is a prophecy of the Antichrist. Okay? Let's, let's look at this, and we need to... Sp- pay specific attention in verse 17. We're going to start in verse 15. And the Lord said unto me, Take unto thee yet the instruments of a foolish shepherd. For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land, which shall not visit those that be cut off, neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that that is broken, nor feed that that standeth still. But he shall eat the flesh of the fat, and tear their claws in pieces. This is not a good shepherd. Woe unto the idol shepherd. How is that word spelled? I-D-O-L. This is speaking of a shepherd of idols, leading you into idolatry. And what it says he will do is what we saw there in verse 16. He won't visit those that are cut off, He won't seek the young one. He won't heal the broken or feed those that stand still. But he shall eat of their flesh of the fat and tear their claws in pieces. All right? This shepherd that you're following, and Paul relates this to them, you were led away by this idol shepherd. You were led away by these idols. People are drawn to deity. And they shirk away and hide from the glory of God... And so they make a God for their own selves. And it may be their own heart that is their God. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. God Almighty knows your heart, and he knows if you have an idol in there. But it says, Woe unto the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm. And here here it is speaking to uh, what will be the Antichrist, because we see this played out in the book of Revelation. Uh, Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. When something is utterly darkened, it is put to death. You'll see in the book of Revelation that the Antichrist is assassinated and then raised back to life by that false prophet. That is one of the things that gathers everybody to him. Okay? And we see that prophesied here. But that same spirit of Antichrist is in the world today. Okay? This is what leads us away. And that Antichrist is those idols. Okay? And they are leading us away. And, and Paul basically takes them and puts them under that and shows them, listen, you were led away to dumb idols, all right? Being, again, trying to awaken them to their state of where they are at, what they had been involved in, what they are now capable of. Those idols had no power. Those idols could not give them any gift at all, nothing. All they could do is collect dust and take up space in their home. That's all. But he's about to unveil to them the power of Almighty God in these spiritual gifts that he did give them. Okay, let's keep going. Verse 3. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. Now, as as we have studied before, not every capital S spirit in your King James Bible is speaking of the third part of the Godhead. It's not speaking of the Holy Spirit, or more, more rightly said, the Holy Ghost. Okay? It is speaking of, and what it is, that capital S Spirit, it is one of the personal spirits of the Godhead, either the Father, the Son, or the Holy Ghost, 
working in or through a person in need. Okay? That is what it means when you see a capital S spirit in your Bible. And that's what it's denoting here. But this is one of the few places where this capital S is speaking of the Holy Ghost. How do we know that? Because it tells us at the end of the verse. No, uh, no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Okay? There's clarity given there. This Spirit that is spoken of is the Holy Ghost. No man being that is speaking by the Holy Ghost can call Jesus accursed. Okay? That Spirit of Antichrist cannot rule in a person's life if the Holy Ghost is in them. It cannot happen. In the same token, and we mentioned this this morning, Paul comes right out and says, No man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. We're going to look at a couple places here where this uh, plays out. Actually, just one here. Uh, in Paul's own conversion. I, I hope to prove to you that Paul was converted right there on that Damascus road. Okay, Let's go to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, playing right off of this, no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 9 and verse 3. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now, I want to point out here very specifically that Saul was under conviction of his sinful nature. And he writes of this many times throughout. Okay? He was under conviction. Every time he would throw a person into prison, every time he'd hear the preaching, every time he would see that, he was pricked. But more specifically, every time he read the law. Because he said, if it wasn't for the law, I had not known sin. So I would not have known lust, except that the law said, thou shalt not covet. That's why I personally believe that that rich young ruler that came to Jesus and went away sad because he had great possessions, I really, truly, the more I think about it, the more I'm convinced of this. Uh, again, it's just my opinion. I can't prove it. But I truly believe this. That rich young ruler was Saul, the Pharisee. The timing would have been right for him to be a young ruler. He was very rich. Paul was, Saul, the Pharisee, was very rich. He had great possessions. He had done everything and kept everything perfectly from his youth. Saul the, Paul said, uh, as touching the law, I was blameless. Okay? Everything matches up perfectly. Until Jesus tells him to sell everything he has, take up his cross, and follow me. And it says that he went away sad because he had great possessions. Right at that very point, Jesus Christ took Saul the Pharisee and put him under that tenth commandment, thou shalt not covet. And he saw that he was covetous, and he went away sad because of that. Okay? Um, that's just what I believe. And now those pricks are finally catching up. And now that Jesus that he saw, again, using the terminology, as a ruddy Jew, convicting him and putting him under that law, comes to him and says, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, comma, Lord, comma, what wilt thou have me to do? Lord. He called him Lord. No man can call Jesus Christ Lord but by the Holy Ghost. That very instant, when he saw the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, he saw his wretchedness, was brought under that law, and saw Jesus Christ as his Lord and his God. Instantly submissive. You don't see a prayer here, do you? You don't see a Roman's road. It hadn't been written yet. He didn't write the book of Romans. Okay. Um, all you see is a man being confronted with his sin and confronted with the Lord Jesus Christ and coming to repentance and calling him Lord. 
And it continues on there because it says, what wilt thou have me to do? Saul the Pharisee would never have called this upstart Jesus Lord and then asked him, what, what should I do? What, what do you want me to do? Okay. Uh, in, in, I believe it's in Galatians, Paul says that he was a blasphemer. The only way a Pharisee could have been a blasphemer is if he called Jesus Christ, not God. Okay. Uh, and at this point, Saul the Pharisee didn't care about that anymore. Jesus was his Lord and his God. He saw that Jesus Christ as being the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. He knew this is God. Right? Uh, and so, back into 1 Corinthians 12, having that in your mind when you look at verse 3, wherefore I give you understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. I have a feeling that he had in his mind there that time on that road to Damascus when he called him Lord for the first time. Uh, look at verse 4. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Now, what Spirit is this speaking of? Again, the Holy Ghost. Okay? Uh, you see it, it carried on. There is nothing new that has been introduced, so it will revert back to the last Spirit that was spoken of. Okay? This is how we study these things out. Uh, we'll turn to Romans chapter 12. It should be just a couple pages back. Romans chapter 12 tells us, verses 4 through 6, <clears throat> Romans 12, 4 through 6, it says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. And here it is, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Now, I just listed out some, a bunch of gifts. The fancy, shiny, look-at-me gifts today that are used in, in many churches are prophecy, and tongues and healings. Those three, prophecy, tongue, and healings. Uh, the, the gift of healing is used to, to uh, show that the power and the presence of God is here and it's working through a person. The gift of prophecy is to propose yourself that you have the ear of God and God has your ear. The gift of tongues, which the tongues practice today didn't start until the 1920s by a woman, and this, and not, again, please understand, I'm not saying anything against women. You know that's not my heart. But if you turn to 1 Corinthians 13, and we look, or 14 rather, and you look at the proper use of the gift of tongues, women are not even allowed to do it. Okay? Uh, we look at our Bible as the absolute authority not what we see happening before us. Oh, I saw it happen. But except it's usually somebody that knows somebody that saw it happen. Every time I've talked with anybody that has seen healings or has seen sign gifts practiced, uh, seen mountains moved, whatever it may be, it's third-hand information. Okay? Um, just something to consider. Take these things that I'm giving you, and, and as I've said before, Take them and file them away and let God make that conclusion. Okay, uh, but here, these gifts, we always think of prophecy. We always think of these, these big ones, but there's a gift of prophecy, and then there's a gift of ministry. There's the gift of teaching. There's the gift of exhortation. There's the gift of giving. There's the gift of ruling. There's the gift of diligence, and there's the gift of mercy. How come we don't ever hear about any of those? Where are those practiced? And where are the classes to learn those spiritual gifts? By the way, nobody in Acts chapter 2 had to take a class to learn how to speak in tongues. That was the nature of Acts chapter 2. I'm laying foundation here. We don't, we don't really have time to dive deep into chapter 12, but we are laying a good foundation for next week. Uh, this, is, this is going to be a 
a long time through these three chapters. I guarantee it. I guarantee it's going to take a few nights to get through this. Okay? But as we study them out, if you can take notes, take notes. Uh, they're all going to be recorded, put on YouTube and the Facebook page, uh, so you can go back and review. Uh, don't take my word for it. Again, flesh and blood cannot reveal these things unto you. Only our Father which is in heaven. Okay? And so we have to be very cautious as we tread into this. I'm going to say some things that are contrary to the generally accepted norm. I will. Do you know why? Because it's what the Bible says. Okay? But we will examine them in detail. And if by the end I have not laid my case well enough, then I will step down. And we will stop studying these gifts. We'll move on to another book. That's how serious I am about this. We're going to examine this thing properly. Amen? Uh, kind of a stern, serious way to, to end a, a time of preaching and teaching, but uh, it's 7 o'clock, and uh, our time is gone already. So uh, we'll, we'll pick right back up in chapter 12, verse 4, and we're going to start just diving into this. We're going to look at the three sign gifts that are said will end. There are three specific ones that are said will end. And one of them is not the one that you're... One of them that isn't said is going to end is one that is still practiced in many charismatic churches today. Okay? We have to be cautious when we tread into this stuff. Don't look at this with the mindset of, I read it out of this book and so this is what it says. I heard it this way in Bible college, so I know that that's what it is. This is the general body of Christian information, and I know that that is what this is meaning. And so that's my conclusion. No, no. Approach these next three chapters as though you've never heard anything about them before. And let the King James Bible give you your doctrine. Amen?